2019. And uh, we put together a great uh, group of speakers. And to begin, I just want to do a quick update. So my name is Don Krause. I'm the vice chairman of the Multiple System Atrophy Coalition. I've been volunteering and on the board of the MSA Coalition now. This is my uh, 21st year. We've been doing it for a while. And um, it's been amazing to watch the MSA Coalition grow over the years. And luckily, as we head into this pandemic, we're really well positioned, we're a strong organization, so we're gonna come through this uh, pandemic uh, fine. And in fact, um, we've largely been posi positioned as a virtual organization, so uh, we've moved over to working from home and working as a team very well together uh, during this, during this uh, crisis. Um, so I'm gonna provide a couple updates on the MSA Coalition, and then we have a great keynote speaker, Dr. Nicholas McFarland from the University of Florida. He's gonna be uh, providing the main content about MSA care during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we also have Lisa Warren, who is a therapist at the University of Florida, and she's going to be providing uh, tips on staying active while staying at home. And then I'm very excited to have a special guest, uh, somebody from the multiple system atrophy community, Austin Crawford, patient, and I'm sure many of you are aware of him through his uh, very strong advocacy and awareness uh, initiatives. And then time permitting, uh, we're hoping to have uh, plenty of time for lots of questions and answers uh, that you might have about um, care during the pandemic and, and perhaps other questions, questions of the MSA coalition, et cetera. Next slide, please. So, Part of what I want to do in my update is just uh, assure you that the MSA coalition is getting a lot done uh, during this pandemic. This was us before the pandemic. This is our, on the left, our entire uh, board of directors. This was at the Florida conference um, last uh, October in, in uh, Orlando, Florida. It was actually hosted by Dr. McFarland, tonight's uh, keynote speaker. And this picture was taken of the MSA coalition board after our Sunday uh, board meeting. So you can see we're all together not six feet apart. Uh, this is me in a nice suit on uh, March 5th, 2018, the MSA Coalition, along with uh, um, some partners and also patients and caregivers, I had the honor of ringing the closing bell of the New York Stock Exchange. So we were, we were dressed up in suits and uh, uh, had an incredible opportunity to raise awareness for MSA. Uh, next slide. And this is us today. So this was a recent committee meeting call that we had via GoToMeeting. You can see we're all in our home offices on the left here, uh, getting important work done. Um, this is a close up of me uh, doing work on the website from my computer. You can see I have on a nice ratty t-shirt and even some pajamas. Um, so that's a pretty typical uh, workout for me now that, now that we're at home. Uh, tonight I have a nice uh, MSA Coalition vest on and, and a nice shirt. So I'm dressed up for tonight for, for you guys. Next slide. So um, as I said, we still have a lot of things going on. One of the big um, tasks that we're working on right now is planning for the 2020 annual conference. And obviously because of the pandemic, a lot of our initial plans uh, went up in the air and we're, uh, we're trying to figure out how to proceed. Most likely we're gonna be doing an online virtual meeting this year. Uh, we are really busy, uh, Cindy Romer, our, uh, our committee chair, uh, exploring platforms that will give us the, the best possible ways of presenting high quality presentations, presentations that you've gotten used to, as well as hopefully having some smaller group sessions where you guys can have opportunities to interact with, with other MSA families. So um, as soon as we have an update on how we're gonna be proceeding with this, uh, we are going to be announcing it via our newsletter, our social media channels, and on our website. So please stay tuned for that announcement. Next slide. We're also working really hard to stay connected uh, with the MSA community. So our support hotline, which has been up and running for as long as the, uh, the Shai Dreger support group going back 30 years, and now the MSA coalition, which we have become, uh, has been in service for that entire time. Right now, it's uh, led by Larry Kellerman. He's a former caregiver. Uh, he does an amazing job. He's extremely knowledgeable, extremely compassionate and uh, he answers phone calls. If he does not answer, it goes to a voicemail and he will either uh, respond via a phone call back or forward it to Vera James or Judy Biedenhardt who are his, his backups and they are equally knowledgeable, compassionate and capable. So it's a great way during this time to stay connected with somebody uh, 
uh, in the MSA community that has a deep knowledge base. Uh, Diane Atkins has been running our uh, monthly newsletter. Um, we've become much more regular with that since she took over. So every single month we, we send out great content via the newsletter. She actually today just put out a call to the board for content for the May newsletter, and that will be going out at, uh, within the first couple of days of May. Uh, I, I run the multiple system atrophy blog. Largely, I put the content onto the onto the uh, onto the blog, but I do write more of the business-related blog posts about fundraising and MSA coalition updates. Larry Kellerman, our support hotline volunteer, does an amazing job writing blogs from the caregiver perspective. We've had a number of patients who have expressed an interest in blogging and have sent us guest blog posts. And I highly encourage anybody listening that is interested in doing so to email me at dkraus at msacoalition.org with your ideas, or even if you have a blog already written, to send it to me, and we will do our best to get it onto our, onto our blog. And now, of course, we have the webinars. You're watching the first initial webinar, um, and uh, we're hoping to begin organizing a series of webinars to keep everybody uh, informed and connected. Next slide. And then lastly, I wanna update you on where we stand with some important research. Uh, the MSA Coalition has been doing seed grant funding since 2013, and uh, we've funded over $2 million in seed grants uh, dating back to, to that time. Uh, this past December, we put out a call for new proposals. We received 27 applications requesting over $1.3 million in funding. So those applications had been forwarded to our scientific advisory board. They're listed at the bottom of my screen. Dr. Gregor Wenning is the chair of the scientific advisory board. And he, along with the SAB and ad hoc reviewers, uh, reviewed all 27. Uh, each proposal is reviewed by three reviewers and they are scored. So that process has taken place and they had been forwarded to our MSA Coalition Research Committee, which then ranked and listed the top proposals, which are now uh, in the hands of the full uh, board of directors for review and voting on funding. And we are hoping to make all of those announcements uh, by the beginning of June 1st. So I do wanna uh, just say special thanks to our research committee. They do an amazing job on this. Uh, Pam Bauer, Carol Langer, uh, Larry Kellerman, and Dr. Vic Kurana are, are the uh, research committee along with the scientific advisory board and our ad hoc reviewers. You can be fully assured that the process that we go through and how we spend our money on research is, is world-class, top-notch, and it's ensuring that the best possible research is being funded by the money that you donate and fundraise. Next slide. Okay, so I do have one quick update uh, financially that I, I forgot to mention. Uh, we have finished our 2019 financial audit and uh, you will be able to, our 990 is now being prepared. And so our, our, uh, re the, the release of that information is gonna be very soon. And we highly encourage you, no matter what charity you are donating to, whether it's an MSA charity or a charity for other causes, that you look into their mission statement, review their financial documents, and ensure that uh, the money that you are donating is going in the direction that you want it to. And with that, I'd like to now move on to our keynote presenter. Uh, we all agreed ahead of the, uh, of the presentation to introduce ourselves, uh, but Dr. Nick McFarland hosted our 2000 and 19 conference in Orlando, Florida. He's a dedicated volunteer to the cause for both the MSA Coalition and the, and the patient community. And I do wanna give him a special shout out and thanks and appreciation for all of the work that he does on all of our behalfs. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Nick McFarland. Thank you, Don. Um, I really appreciate being invited to do this. It's actually um, really a pleasure to kind of be with everybody today. I see there's over 90, uh, folks on our uh, list here already in terms of attendees, I think we're heading up to over 100 um, attendees. So this is fantastic, actually. Uh, I appreciate everybody being online with us um, for this webinar. Um, this is a great opportunity. I know a lot of people are at home, um, kind of anxious, worried about the coronavirus, and um, this is kind of a good opportunity to kind of air some information out and kind of give you guys some advice. Um, so, 
Uh, for those of you who know our clinic, University of Florida, you know, we're open, we're available to see patients. I know that clinics have kind of largely, um, there's a place that you probably don't want to go to, and we'll talk about that, uh, but uh, they are open for urgent patients. There are ways to get there. There are also new ways to get a hold of your doctor, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So I, I think first, kind of my, my goal today um, for you guys was really to talk a little bit about the coronavirus. Uh, I know you've heard probably way too much about it already, uh, but uh, I, I think um, knowledge is really power, and I want to empower you guys with the facts about this virus and how it may or may not affect you um, and how you can kind of deal with it, get beyond it. I hope, uh, at least here in Florida, hopefully uh, we are at that peak and sort of on the other end, um, but we still have a ways to go. Um, before this virus is out of our system. And I, I guess people are still worried about a second wave too. So, um, but we're hoping for the best, but planning for the worst in a lot of ways. Um, and I think knowing the facts is really the important part here for you all. Um, so let me um, forward this on. So a lot of the information I'm gonna talk about is taken from a couple of sites, um, obviously also from other, other you know, places, but I think I want to point two um, websites for both of you uh, to look at. So one is really the MSA blog. Um, a lot of the information is actually on there on the MSA Coalition website. So if you're not familiar with that, I think Don, you guys can, or Pam, you guys can talk a little bit more about where to find that on the website. Um, second of all, I think um, MSA is a Parkinson disorder, and I think you'll find a lot of good information at the uh, Parkinson's Disease Foundation website as well about COVID. Um, you know, my colleague and chair, Dr. Mike Oaken, um, heads the medical uh, director of that. And I think there's a lot of really good information on there and it really overlaps um, a lot of what I'm gonna say. So it's kind of pulled from a couple of different sites, okay? So let me make a couple of points here, okay? Um, you know, first of all, you know, we don't really know much about COVID-19 coronavirus and MSA or other Parkinson's disorders. So it's really not known whether the fact that you have a neurodegenerative disease or that you are more vulnerable um, to this virus or not. Um, however, that said, you know, anybody with a chronic illness who is somewhat frail and might actually be somewhat immunocompromised, although we, again, don't know that, you know, people with MSA have a compromised immune system, but um, if you are more frail, then the immune system is somewhat more compromised. Um, and in particular, really, MSA patients who have respiratory issues. So this is a respiratory virus. These individuals with respiratory issues are especially vulnerable because um, you know, MSA is frequently associated with impaired respiratory or breathing control. Um, and patients are, especially those who have aspiration, at risk for pneumonia, um, particularly in advanced stages. So uh, First slide, really, I just want to urge all MSA patients just to take vigorous precautions, okay, um, with this disease. There's no reason to be exposed and no reason to take risks on this disease. So what about the coronavirus? So as um, you probably have heard from the news, unless you've uh, been turning it off, I realize it's kind of anxiety provoking, but um, COVID-19, as it's called now, is a respiratory tract illness that's related to the SARS virus, um, COVID-2 now. Um, it is a coronavirus, coronavirus um, which is a frequent cause of the common cold. Um, there are thousands of coronavirus actually out there um, that you probably have been exposed to at one point in time and fought off a common cold. But every once, you know, every now and then, a new virus spontaneously occurs, mutations occur, and new viruses come out. Um, and those viruses, we have little protection. So if they're a new virus, you've never been exposed to, your immune system doesn't know anything about this virus, therefore, there's little protection uh, for the virus. So that's the big deal here, is that the population had never seen this virus and was being exposed to, it, and it's highly infectious. So it was originally seen mainly in Asia, primarily China, Korea, Japan. But as those of you have probably seen on the news, this virus has quickly spread um, due to travel, um, spread to Europe, especially Italy and Spain, and of course now all across Europe, and then of course to the United States of America, okay? So 
what about this disease? So most patients do experience mild symptoms, such as like a runny nose, cough, fatigue, just basically run-of-the-mill flu-like symptoms. However, there are those patients who develop very, very serious illness, um, and particularly the elderly are um, who are more frail, um, and those with underlying medical problems. Now, we're in the CDC, those underlying medical problems are respiratory illness, um, heart disease, diabetes or other degenerative diseases like this um, that may also cause compromise. So these patients experience more severe disease such as pneumonia. Um, it's important also to note that as well as the elderly, young adults also are affected, some with severe disease. Okay? It's important partly because these are the folks who actually get disease. They may not be um, as severe. Um, they may recover some point, but they, during that period of time, they may actually spread the disease. So what are the main concerns here, really? Um, the thing really the coronavirus is that mortality rate is substantially higher than with the respiratory viruses. So it's estimated to be about one to 3%. And in contrast, you know, the influenza virus um, mortality rate is about 0.1%. So essentially a order of magnitude greater. So that's the big deal here. And many people are dying from this. So one thing is we really don't know the true number of infections out there, um, particularly the mild infections or people who may get exposed, develop immunity right away, have barely any kind of infections. Those are the people who worry about transmitting it. This virus spreads very efficiently and transmits before symptom onset, before the arrival of, on, of symptoms, or you even know you have the virus. It stays in the nose and the saliva for weeks, even after improvement. It's important and when people are already talking about how we're going to reintegrate um, it's going to be important to get testing done um, so a couple of misconceptions and i wanted to focus mainly on masks as number one kind of misconception here really um, so um, the reason a mask comes up is that originally it was thought that you know, everyone you know started to wear a mask and that the cdc wasn't really recommending masks um, but turns out that there are increasing numbers of those who are infected and then with the knowledge that the COVID-19 can spread via aerosolized particles from coughing, sneezing, or speech. Um, we talked about sort of spreading apart six feet distance, but actually the, there's reports saying this virus can aerosolize and even travel as far as 27 feet uh, from a healthy individual from just a cough or a sneeze. So with that knowledge, so the recommendations have actually changed now. So individuals should wear a surgical mask or facial cover when going out into the public. Now, on the right is an example of a surgical mask. Um, and on the bottom right are some of these homemade masks that um, many families are actually starting to make. These are really good. Um, these will block a lot of those aerosolized particles, especially if you sneeze or cough. Um, but these are recommended. What's shown here in the middle is what's called the N95 masks. So these are masks that are found, well, they can be found in harvest or in other places for dust, but these are what are in short supply. Um, even still, though increasingly, um, people are getting some supplies at, at different hospitals, but this is the gear that um, should be reserved to first responders or healthcare providers, or those really close to COVID-19 patients. Um, this is something that is, Called an N95, N95 is at least 95% effective against um, blocking the spread of the virus, um, at least respiratory wise. So um, I want to also point out really that um, the fact that you're wearing a mask does not provide you ultimate protection. So even the N95 is only 95% effective, of course. If you're wearing one, it's not fitted, it's going to be even less uh, protective. These masks, um, while they may protect, not protect you, but they protect others from the virus. Um, it's important to note really that they're not ultimate protection and they are not a substitute for social distancing. Okay, um, important note. So what are some of the recommendations uh, for this era of COVID-19? Okay, Number one, if you haven't heard it, um, wash your hands frequently with soap or water um, or some hand sanitizers that contain at least 60% alcohol. Look for that 60% or higher number on the bottles, okay? If you're um, trying to say hi to folks, try to do these sort of fist or elbow bumps or uh, bow instead of handshakes or hugs. Uh, I know 
we like to be social. Um, this is a really tough one, even for myself, uh, especially when I see patients. Socially distance, okay? Stay home, limit visitors. Uh, as you've probably heard, we're all staying home, trying to sort of flatten that curve. Limit visitors, avoid travel and crowds of people. That means um, flying in particular. Um, travel has been a big question for many of us. Um, another one I actually want to mention really is reschedule non-urgent non doctor or dentist appointments if you haven't done already. If necessary, um, we now can do visits by phone or telehealth, and I'll talk more about that in just a minute, okay? It's important to stay in contact with family and friends, though. So although we want you to social isolate and stay home, we don't want you to completely isolate yourselves. Um, it's really important. Um, I think by now, many of us are getting cabin fever. Um, I have two kids, they've already got cabin fever. <laughs> um, the rest of us are just getting anxious watching the news. Um, so it's important to stay in contact with our family and friends, talk to each other, use the phone, um, use FaceTime um, or whatever uh, video chat program in, in the era of the internet um, like we're using right now. These are excellent ways to keep in contact with folks um, that you know, particularly family members. Um, another one actually, so keep abreast of local and state recommendations. Uh, watching the news is okay, but limit your dose if news is really anxiety provoking. I know that watching the news with all this terrible information about patients dying, um, it, it can be really nerve wracking. So um, it is important to stay uh, abreast of stuff, to know the recommendations, but again, um, if it's really um, driving you nuts, um, just making someone you're uh, more and more anxious, turn it off, okay? Um, so what do you do? If you get sick, of course, call your doctor before going to see them because they need to prepare. They need to be able to protect you and others, okay? So if you think you have coronavirus symptoms, they'll need to know about that. So, um, or that you've been exposed, we need to know that because that, we will prepare a room, we'll make sure that we have the proper protective equipment. And we'll also provide the same thing for you as well, okay? Um, another recommendation is um, asking for 90 day supplies of your medication. So if you don't wanna go out, limit that exposure. Um, many pharmacies, if you haven't done it already, will um, are either delivering the medications via mail order or they have um, their windows that are open and you can go right up there. But with 90 days, it'll sort of limit your having to go back and forth now to get your medications. Um, this is a question that has come up a lot um, with a number of my patients. They've asked me about vaccinations. Um, the two biggies really for anyone over 65 or who has got um, a dis disorder like MSA, I would recommend to get the influenza shot and the pneumonia shot in particular. Um, viral illness usually begets other illnesses um, and other um, bacterial infections can superimpose on top of viral illness. So it's important to get these um, vaccinations for you, okay? So not an excuse. Um, lastly, just because uh, the recommendations are to stay inside and isolate doesn't mean that you should stop exercising or stay active. Um, we, in fact, encourage you to do the exercises at home, um, around your community. Going outside, of course, is safe, but certainly practice social distancing. Okay. Um, lastly, really, so when should I see the doctor is really a big question that comes up frequently for me. So, um, or one, if you suspect that you have COVID-19 infection, such as having a high fever, or cough, breathing difficulty, or even chest pain, call your doctor. Okay. Um, University of Florida has a protocol for testing and many sites have a protocol for testing and dealing with patients, but call your doctor before you go anywhere and they will give you recommendations. They'll tell you where to go. Um, not every place at the University of Florida is doing testing. There are three specific sites at UF and it's different at every place to go. So if severe, seek, uh, of course, um, seek urgent treatment, such as an ER evaluation. So what is urgent, okay? So urgent, I put in quotes here, um, in terms of other issues beyond COVID-19, what should prompt you to go see your doctor, uh, you know, physically, okay? So things like frequent falls, okay? Swallowing difficulty, if you're losing a lot of weight, failing to thrive, um, marked pain, stiffness, rigidity, um, abnormal posturing, we call dystonia, developing contractures, this is urgent, okay? Um, low blood pressures, um, the hypertension leading to blackouts, falling out, um, fainting frequently. Um, this is certainly something you should call your doctor about 
and may need to be seen urgently um, for medication management, something that we could maybe do over the phone, but more likely would be better done actually in a clinic visit. Um, if you develop urinary symptoms, particularly urinary retention and unable to urinate, this is a medical issue, emergency, so if that's an urgent issue, you need to be evaluated whether urinary tract infection is going on or something else is going on, it needs to be treated. You can't go without being able to go pee. Um, and then lastly, someone with you know, altered mental status or delirium. So this is a medical emergency or urgency, basically. Um, if you're acutely confused um, and delirious, this is an issue you should speak to your doctor about and may need or require urgent evaluation. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but I wanted to give you some ideas of what would prompt you to go see the doctor physically. Um, now, lastly, um, the uh, Center for Medicare actually has recently allowed us to do telehealth, tele telehealth visits for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, this is a real biggie. I'm not saying that we weren't able to do this before with the advent of the in internet, but um, the go federal government has allowed us actually to do this and it's actually becoming more of a standard practice now um, in the era of COVID-19. And it's pretty amazing actually um, living in this current era with the internet available to us and phones and, and tablets that we can do FaceTime and things and chats on. Um, telehealth provides us huge advantages, okay? Um, we now have, you guys have uh, patients now, caregivers are now remote access to us, the doctors and providers via the phone or internet. Um, and uh, huge here in Florida, which is a big state, um, avoid travel, potential coronavirus exposures. It's easy to do from the comfort of your home and it's secure, okay? Um, and it's covered. It's covered by most private insurers and it's covered now by Medicare and Medicaid. Um, that said, um, I want to point out that again, it's not really a substitute for in-person visits when they are needed, but it's definitely an option um, increasingly being used. So how should you prepare for this? Okay, um, this is a whole new area, okay? Schedule your visits, give us a call and we'll decide, do you need to be seen in person or can we do a telehealth visit? Um, so with that, we will schedule it. We'll give you connection information, instructions how to get online. Um, it's important to have a caregiver and list somebody um, for these visits. It's great if you have a computer, um, but it turns out with some experience we're starting to have now is that it's sort of better to have a, a phone or a tablet that's a little bit more portable. Um, and it's important to actually have a camera person so they can actually uh, move the camera around and show parts um, so that we can examine um, the MSA patient. Um, you'll need to download some software, although most of these download automatically. Um, and then uh, when doing sort of the imaging, make sure you have some natural lighting and enough space available to move, move around, okay? And to be able to demonstrate some of the exam. So um, telehealth is really a great option for folks right now. Um, but again, it's just an interim. Uh, we'll definitely want to see you guys back in the clinic and we're looking forward to that time when we can see you back again. I'm in our clinics. And with that, um, I'm going to stop and give power back to you. Guys, got it? Yep. I think we'll have questions later. Over to you, Lisa. Okay, great. Uh, do I have control of the slides? Uh, yes, you do. Terrific. Thank you so much. So I appreciate you all having me. My name is Lisa Warren. I'm actually an occupational therapist. Um, I am the rehab manager at uh, the University of Florida, the Fixell Institute, where Dr. McFarland is. So I'm going to talk to you. Uh oh, I lost my screen. Sorry. Um, do you all know where, do you all see the slides? I have lost them. I can take over the control and show my screen. Oh, okay. That'd be great. Okay, here Thank we are. Thank you so much. Terrific. Okay, I'm ready for the next one. 
So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, how to stay active during this pandemic when we're all on lockdown and trying to stay home. When you go and see your therapist, your occupational therapist or your physical therapist, so often they are going to tell you to stay active. And it's so important to stay mentally and physically involved in life. And then here we are in a situation where it's extremely challenging to do just that. So first I want to talk about just some simple things to, to keep doing. Uh, the activities that you're currently or were currently doing at home, continue to do those. Uh, the little things like cleaning the house, cooking, laundry, gardening, they're all actually really good for us. They require a little bit of activity, require some cognition, some planning, some sequencing. So they're good things to do. So continue to do those. Uh, throughout this pandemic, the things that you were doing before, if they're still safe for you to do safety first always, then uh, by all means, continue to do those. Uh, walking around the house, um, just making laps around your house and throughout your house is a good way to get a little bit of exercise. If you're not able to go out or can't go out always, um, you can walk around the house, do some, some laps from one room to the other. Uh, taking a walk outside is great. Dr. McFarland had referred to this earlier. If you're able to keep social distancing, depending on where you live, uh, taking a walk outside can be really beneficial. Use a, an assistive device if needed. If you need a walker or a cane or uh, pushing a wheelchair um, is also uh, a way to get some exercise. Stretching or modified yoga. So some of you deal with a lot of rigidity with MSA. So stretching is really important to do. There are several videos online and there are free apps on smartphones for modified yoga. Some are seated yoga, some are yoga for seniors. There are multiple ways to do yoga, which is just a, a good way to stretch. Or you may have a stretching program that your therapist had provided uh, previously. So these are super important to continue to do. Stretching helps to warm the muscles, loosens it up. You move easier after you stretch. It also minimizes the, the chance that the muscle is going to shorten from being stiff for an extended period of time and not being stretched. So stretching is super, super important for all of us, especially those of you that are experiencing some stiffness or rigidity with this. Next slide. So exercising at home, you can exercise with things that you have in your home. Uh, the lady in the top left corner just has a couple of bottles of laundry detergent that she's doing some bicep curls with. Um, the two that are seated have soup cans or vegetable cans that they're doing some exercises with. So if you want a little resistance and you don't have weights at home or you don't have stretchy bands, uh, grab something that's at home and use it to exercise. So strengthening is good for all of us. Active exercise is super good. So if you can do some strengthening, you can do it seated, you can do it standing. Uh, grab some items at home that have a little bit of weight uh, and then do your exercises, bicep curls or work on your shoulders, work on your triceps, anything that you can work on uh, with the things around the home will be beneficial. Next slide. Here are just some simple seated standing or seated or standing marching. So you can march in place, whether you're sitting down, you can march in place standing. Um, if you're not able to, to move your legs, you can just move your arms or you can move your legs and your arms at the same time. So either way um, is a really good way to get some active exercise. So in this one, it's not necessarily a resistive exercise. It's just an active exercise. And doing something like this is a really good way to, to build up some stamina. So we need active exercise to increase our endurance. The more you sit or the less you do, the more tired you actually are. It, it has the adverse effect. You can't lie around all day and be, then be more energetic in the evening. It, it really works um, the opposite way. So you want to have some active exercise, walking or marching or both. And then you, if you feel like some uh, resistive exercise, you can grab something around the house if you don't have weights or stretchy bands. Next slide. So. That was a little bit on physical exercise. Uh, mental exercise is just as important. Uh, you know, when we're out and going to restaurants and, and going to parties and being around people, we get a lot of cognitive stimulation. When we stay home, uh, we often get less 
cognitive stimulation. So there are other ways to supplement with that. Uh, board games are a great way to do it. Yahtzee and Scrabble. Uh, one that Don had suggested was uh, Ticket to Ride. I wasn't familiar with that, but I looked that one up and it looks like a great board game. And uh, there may be some um, online options to that as well. Uh, cards, many of you already know how to play cards and do play cards, and that is a great cognitive activity. Take some planning, a little bit of strategy, um, another great way to stay mentally active. Online games, there are several online games. Words with Friends, um, House Party is a face-to-face -face social networking way to get a group together, but there are also games that you can play on House Party. And uh, one of these, which is one of my favorites, is called Heads Up. And it's a great way to work on word retrieval and memory. It's a terrific game. It's also a game you can just download on your phone, also a board game called Heads Up. Uh, but there are other games that you can play in this um, House Party. There's trivia games and a few others. So another great way to interact with other people, but also to uh, play games and stay cognitively stimulated. Uh, Sudoku, many of you already do that. Word search, crossword puzzles. So if you can't go out and buy these items in hard copy, they are online. So are games like um, Solitaire. Don't get much uh, social interaction with that, but you do get some cognitive uh, stimulation with it. And then jigsaw puzzles are always um, a fun thing to do. Next slide. So in addition to that, there are some classes that you can join in live. This one in particular, hopefully you'll have um, uh, this uh, to, to look at and to go online um, after the webinar tonight. But, this is a live class that's done here at the University of Florida. It's called Dance for Life. This, um, they meet Wednesdays from two to three. So this one you have to join in on Wednesdays from two to three. So it's not archived like many of the other items are. But this one, the password is there. You go in and it's, they teach dance for all levels. You can be standing, you can be seated. Um, it's just a wonderful way to get a lot of activity and hopefully in an, an enjoyable way. Many, many of our folks really enjoy the Dance for Life classes. Next slide. These next few are recorded classes, meaning you can go into these at any time. So at your convenience, there's not a particular time that you have to be online to participate in these classes. This first one that is called Vocal Exercises for Parkinson's. So with MSA being an atypical Parkinsonism, uh, there are a lot of features that are very similar uh, to Parkinson's. So this vocal exercise uh, is a YouTube exercise class that works on projection uh, and speaking clearly. So it's a great way to, to work on vocalization if you're having some difficulty with your speech. The next one below that, move and shout, just what it says. It's an active exercise class online um, that is on YouTube that you can do at any time. And you do it at your level. So you don't have to be standing or have terrific balance to do these things. Many of these um, online classes show you ways that you can, can get a good exercise session in, but perhaps in a seated position or holding on to a walker or maybe the back of a chair for increased balance support. Next slide. And then the last few that I have here, strength and balance. So this one again, another recorded class um, that you can do. You can use the, the cans or the laundry detergent that we talked about before. If you have the stretchy bands, there are some classes that show you what to do with those or um, hand weights, or even cuff weights, if you have those that strap onto your wrist or your ankles. So these strength and balance classes will, will go through a variety of ways to do both of those strength and balance. Again, with the balance, uh, you can do it holding onto a chair, holding on to a walker. There are many, many ways to adapt these to be safe, but also to get a good workout. The other one is balance and core, work, works on a lot of core stability. Tai Chi, just under that, will do some of the same, we'll really work on core stability and balance. So all of these exercises are either for seniors or those 
with some difficulty with balance. So they're all modified and there are ways to do these at different levels. So you can make it a little bit harder or a little bit easier, whatever you need. But staying active, mentally and physically active, always is super important. Just have to think out of the box right now while we're all on lockdown on ways to do this while at home. And I think that's the end of my slides. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lisa. That was excellent information. Do I have, can, could I put that in those links uh, so that they're active on our COVID-19 blog post? I think that would be a great idea. Excellent. So yes, I, will, I will get that done uh, sometime uh, this evening after the webinar. And you can find our COVID-19 information page on the, on the main page of our website at multiplesystematrophy.org. Right below the main banner, we have a yellow box that says COVID-19 information. If you click on that, that will take you to the page where the, those links will be. So uh, thank you very much for joining us, Lisa. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm really excited now to introduce our next uh, and very special guest. He's a member of the multiple system atrophy community. Uh, Austin Crawford has multiple system atrophy. And over the last couple of years, he's become a tremendous awareness guru and advocate for the MSA coalition. Um, I consider him a friend. We've never met in person, uh, but we've, we've talked via text quite frequently. We uh, intermingle on social media. And, uh, and we talk on the phone occasionally, and now we get to uh, speak on this webinar as well. So uh, very excited to hear how Austin is spending uh, his time during uh, this pandemic and staying at home to help the MSA community. All right, thank you, Don. Can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay. Oh uh, yes, this is the first time we've actually got to be able to meet one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I want to thank also the rest of the panels that have donated their time tonight uh, with the MSA patients and the COVID-19 and the staying home and uh, exercising. Um, I met Don probably a couple years ago and okay. as you can see on this picture, um, contacted him to maybe help raise awareness um, of a disease I'd never heard of and kind of document uh, the, our story. And uh, recently, it's uh, March 6th and 7th, it was actually one best documentary at the film festival and raised uh, quite a bit of awareness. And uh, it was great to have that. It also was able to be seen in the Chinese theater in Hollywood, California. Um, and it was an official selection there. So that was an honor to be able to raise some awareness this way. Uh, next slide. Um, if you can go to the uh, multiple system coalition.org, um, I believe in the video section, is it right, Don? There's a uh, tab in, on the main menu bar on the on the home page that's it's on all the pages. It says MSA awareness. If you click on that link, it will take you to our MSA awareness page where these videos are located. And so you can go there and find uh, several others, uh, quite a few others actually. Um, so I recommend going to that while taking the time. Uh, next slide. Um, again, this was from the awareness of the uh, documentary. This was, I believe, during the red carpet evening that night. And I believe the next slide, please, uh, well, we'll get to that to the last one. Uh, this picture is actually a project that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, this is um, a 1970 Dodge Dart that we've actually converted to raise awareness for multiple system activity. Uh, project is called Wheels for Cause 2. Uh, we've actually go you know, two car shows when we can. If I cannot drive, my wife will drive. Uh, but as you can see in the pictures, we'll pass out or hand out MSA coalition bracelets. And the banner is just to raise awareness. Uh, next slide. The 
Facebook, uh, the Wheels for Cause 2, uh, we actually have these uh, shirts. The picture on the right is from the sponsors that have helped us to get the vehicle uh, looking the way it is. And we have actually been able to help offset uh, four wheelchairs. So it's kind of an honor to give back. Uh, next slide. Uh, once again, with my wife um, by my side and sticking there for me during all those times. Uh, this was one of the banners we've had. Um, we really take it about anywhere we go just to get some awareness going that it is out there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for social media, um, yeah, I still do quite a bit of active work um, as far as I can. Uh, the first picture is actually on the Wheels for Cause 2. Uh, my Instagram, I do share the video. Um, show kind of a little bit of, uh, the best way I can put it is trying to be positive on days that are not very well. Um, the YouTube channel that we do, um, I was speaking to my wife and uh, there's times that you don't remember people that you've lost as voice. This is kind of my voice to my family, but I encourage everyone, if you have a phone, just record your family uh, during these times especially, so you can actually go back and take the time to listen to them. Uh, but I do show different things um, electronically. I do have a little bit of help uh, with the family input. Um, we try and do um, videos that anyone can follow. Uh, next slide, please. And if you'd like to follow, uh, we'll, we're actually going to be starting the challenge for myself to do at least one video a week um, going through general symptoms of where MSA could be. So. Hopefully we'll have more videos in the following. And I believe that wraps up mine. That is, yeah, just going back to that uh, YouTube page, Austin. Um, I, I do, uh, for everybody else that wants to follow that page, I just Googled Austin Crawford YouTube. It was the first uh, first link, clicked on it. And when you get to that page in the in the right-hand corner, there's a subscribe button. So if you if you hit the subscribe button um, and there's a little bell for notifications, you'll every time he posts a video, it'll come up. And I guess I'll plug the MSA Coalition YouTube channel as well. And if you could subscribe and hit the notification button on that, uh, we greatly appreciate it as well. And I think, uh, let's see, so we have, um, we have about 12 minutes uh, for questions and answers. So I think we should proceed right to that. And I think um, Alexandra is going to uh, ask the questions that have been posted in the chat. Wonderful. Okay. Um, just a reminder, we invite all of you to submit your questions to our speakers. On the right hand of your screen, you can type your questions into the question, mo into the question box of the GoToWebinar control panel, and I will read them aloud to our speakers. Um, it looks like our first question, um, someone was scheduled to begin taking part in the Biohaven BHV3241 trial this month. Um, it was disrupted by COVID and was put on hold. Do you have any knowledge of when the study will begin taking new participants again, or if there is potential for the new study uh, to continue virtually? So I'm actually gonna send a, I'm trying to, in the background, this is Dr. McFarland, I've been sending some responses to some of the questions. Um, there's a lot of good, really good questions, but this was one that actually I did respond to and I'll, can, I hope people can hear me. Just wait. We can. We can. Okay. Yes, we can. Um, so the bottom line really here is that we and many, many other sites actually are around the country. Um, so it varies by institu institution and to institution and which state. But basically, um, many centers had to basically stop um, and put these trials on hold. Um, this is an elective research trial. Um, it's in the category, it's not a COVID-19 um, based trial. It's not a life-saving, I mean, I, yes, we're worried. We would like to see this thing slow the disease down, but it's not a critical life-saving 
study. So um, most institutions have basically suspended this kind of research. Um, and the reason for that really is, is that we didn't want patients to come in to get exposed to the virus. And for that reason, also caregivers and staff, um, it's just too much of a risk. Um, this is a drug trial for a drug called Redipertisat um, that we do not know works. Um, it's been in a phase one, phase two, but this is the phase three study. It's a large um, one-year study um, and it's looking for, you know, basically tolerability and efficacy at this stage. But the reason we're doing those studies is because we don't know whether it's going to work and it's a randomized trial. Um, so this is exactly one of those types of trials that's kind of been suspended. Um, and this is happening around the country in many different sites. And it's the truth is that different institutions actually have different, slightly different rules, but most of them have suspended for now. So it's just put on hold or pause. Um, it doesn't mean that it won't restart. We do anticipate the trial to restart. The question is when? Um, and we're all watching both the state and federal guidelines as well as our institutional guidelines as to when we'll be able to restart research um, and enroll patients and get them started on treatment. Um, if you were um, enrolled, you were probably told we're not going to start treatment. So that means that does not mean that you wouldn't be still eligible for it, although you might have to go through some additional screening, but um, likely you'll get to be you know, restarted and, or started up into the trial um, as soon as possible. We're all looking for when that's gonna be. So will that be in the middle of summer or will it be fall? I don't have the answer to that. Um, we need to, this kind of goes to other questions that have come up as well. We need to be sure that we're not putting patients at risk, number one. Um, and number two, that we're not putting anyone else at risk um, to the virus. So, and that may require doing you know, widespread COVID-19 testing, which is currently being worked on, okay? I hope that answers the question. To, um, we, um, we just posted a blog on our website, which you can find at multiplesystematic.org as well, um, with question and answers about that study that were answered by Biohaven. That this virus has really affected all research studies in a very, very big way. Um, some of the studies were ongoing and got stopped in the middle, and it's been a huge issue for many of the studies um, where treatments can't be continued. In some cases, they've been allowed, but it's been sort of individual um, decisions. Um, but again, I want to emphasize that the primary studies by now, the focus really is on the COVID-19. Um, and trying to save lives right now and not putting people at risk. Great, one of the newer questions I can read off. Um, any recommendations for safety parameters re-COVID-19 for certified nursing assistants who come regularly into a home to help with advanced MSA family members? We currently have suspended some help during the social distancing period because um, this one person in particular works part-time in a hospital. Um, since her help is essential, they're a little worried about being exposed. So do you have any recommendations for that? Yeah, this is a big issue for all of our patients. Um, um, we're stuck at home. We want to continue, you know, things like therapies, uh, you know, getting visits um, from other folks um, and going back to the hospital. So I think the big issue really is protection for both you as well as the person coming into the home. Um, so uh, I may, maybe Lisa can also uh, talk a little bit about some of the home healthcare workers, but basically what I what we're kind of telling folks and, and different, um, I guess different uh, companies have different rules, but they should be wearing proper protective equipment or PPE um, when they're coming into your home um, and I think you have the right to refuse them, obviously, um, as well as to ask, um, you know, pointed questions, you know, how are you going to protect me bef you know, before you let them come into the house um, and enter there? It's, it, you should be asking these kinds of questions. What kind of protections should I take? What kind of protections are you going to take coming into my uh, house? Um, you, you know, might ask how many other patients are you seeing? Are they at risk? Do they have are you seeing people who are of COVID-19? Uh, 
if that's the case, then you may want to ask even more pointed questions. What kind of things did they do to protect you? Did they remove their outer layer of clothing? Did they change their clothes before they came over to your house? So a lot of pointed questions you can actually ask, but largely it boils down to um, your risk, their risk, um, and then really the potential benefits that you may get from having the therapy. So barring your closing your door completely and locking it to everybody, um, I wouldn't be completely that absolute. Um, you may need that therapy for frequent falling. It may be really critical for you because falling can lead to significant injuries, including head injuries that may lead to hospitalization. So you may need that therapy. So you have to weigh that against the risk of you know, getting COVID and you can mitigate a lot of those risks. So maybe Lisa, you can mention a few. Well, things. a lot, we, we hear that question so often and, and several people have discontinued their home health services out of fear of where the aid or the therapist or the nurse had been prior to coming to the house. So I, you know, each agency has their own rules as to, to what the uh, person coming into the home should have on, but I think that the PPEs are of utmost importance. And then I agree with Dr. McFarland. I think it's only fair to ask the provider how they are protecting you. Uh, what are they doing to take safety measures to make sure that they're not bringing something in from another home into your home? Perfect, thank you. We have time for one more question. Um, I see you got to a Dr. McFarland, but I'll just read it so everyone can hear. How would COVID-19 affect a patient like myself who has a tracheostomy? I'll try not to butcher these words. It resulted from swallowing problems in vocal cord paralysis. Yeah, I think I answered that, but I'll just say it to everybody as well, too, that, um, you know, tracheostomy is done in patients who have breathing issues or difficulty, um, you know, maybe choking or having issues um, and can't get a breath. Uh, they may have strider and they may have reasons to have a tracheostomy, but a tracheostomy is a whole place below the larynx, roughly around here, okay, so that one can breathe more easily, okay. Um, sometimes it's done temporarily for folks who are on a ventilator and need to have that and they go outside the hospital, you can't you know, have a tube in your throat, so they put a temporary tracheostomy in there. But um, in MSA patients, the biggest reason is usually strider or the breathing problem. Um, so as you can imagine, a trach bypasses everything from here, the nose and the throat. So your nose and your throat actually provide some protection um, from, you know, breathing in. You have a lot of protective things like your hair, your nasal mucosa, um, that's the lining of your what's inside your mouth, your nose and inside your mouth, that does provide some protection from things like viruses and you sneeze them out or cough them out. So it's a shorter distance for a virus to go from here down into your lungs. And this is a respiratory illness. So I would assume some of this tracheostomy might be a greater risk um, for getting COVID-19, but once you get it, um, you're, the effect of the virus should be similar to any other patient essentially. Uh, could be any difference, just your risk. Okay, great. Thank you so uh, much. We are, uh, are out of time. How many, Sorry, are there a lot of other questions that were unanswered? Um, one yes, more. we got to most of them. Okay. We can fit in one quick one. I can read off um, the last one. Question is there a yeah, shelter? Mind, that'd be great. And then uh, I was going to say we could, we, we, we could, um, uh, mm -hmm have questions answered and anything that's been asked that wasn't answered we'll put into that COVID-19 uh, blog post as well. Yes, perfect. We will answer the remaining questions there. Um, thank you again to all of our speakers and thank you to each of you for attending today's webinar. The recording and slide deck will be available within 48 hours. For more information, please visit multiplesystematrophy.org. The webinar has now ended. Thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. So are we...